welcome to my channel or welcome back. I've been talking about vaginas a lot lately, vaginal tears and how to prevent them. Let's get right into it. In my other video about my experience, I've shared that there are different kinds of tears. I'm going to read what vaginal tears are. I really liked this website called VoicesForPFD.org, which is a pelvic floor website. They had a lot of great information. According to them, this is what vaginal tears are. Perineal tears. The tissue between the vaginal opening and anal opening, called the perineum, is the intersection of several muscles. Though it is designed to stretch during labor prior to delivery, perineal tears are common. They occur in more than 90% of women having their first vaginal delivery. These obstetrical tears are categorized into four main groups. One category that has first degree and second degree tears. First and second degree tears involve the vaginal skin and underlying vaginal muscles and are the most common types. Third and fourth degree tears involve the vaginal skin and muscles as well as the anal sphincter muscles. Third or fourth degree perennial tears can happen to anyone. About 2% of women experience these type of tears. Risk factors include first vaginal delivery, delivery of babies weighing more than eight pounds, assisted deliveries, especially using forceps or a vacuum device, an episiotomy performed at the time of the current or any previous delivery, babies born with a face looking upward called OP, pushing for many hours before delivery, genetic having a short perineum or weak tissue. Should you tear naturally versus having an episiotomy? One of my favorite labor and delivery nurses called Bumps and Boobs on Instagram has an entire post on this that I'll read and share with you. So this is a post from Bumps and Boobs Instagram discussing an FAQ on vaginal tearing and episiotomies. An episiotomy is the surgical enlargement of the vaginal opening by an incision to the perineum, tissue between the vagina and the anus. Episiotomies are performed to widen the vagina and expedite birth. So back to the FAQ. Tearing versus episiotomy. Episiotomies are not recommended on a routine basis. In fact, they are associated with higher rates of severe perineal trauma and wound complications. Additionally, having an episiotomy could increase the risk of severe tearing in subsequent births. As always, things are not necessarily black and white. According to Up to Date, there are a few instances where an episiotomy may be helpful. Some examples of those situations may be during the need for expedited delivery, i.e. baby is in distress during operative vaginal delivery, or during a shoulder dystocia. Important, your provider should always obtain consent prior to performing an episiotomy. Nobody should ever touch or cut your perineum without permission. All info obtained from up-to-date approach to episiotomy April 2019. It was also edited to add, although some tearing is not uncommon during birth, it is 100% possible to give birth with an intact perineum. Thank you so much, Becca, for sharing that important bit of information. I'm a person who had an unnecessary episiotomy without consent and it is not fun to heal from. With all of that being said, the million dollar question is how can you prevent vaginal tear? Is it preventable? There is a list that I've created from the research that I've done, so I'm not reading from any particular website. And again, I'm not a medical professional, so please always speak with your provider about anything that I suggest or read about in my videos. One of the number one things suggested when preventing a vaginal tear has to be perennial massage. And this was something that I had every intention of doing but never got around to. I tried during my first pregnancy actually, which is shocking because I didn't know anything about birth at that time, but I briefly read about it somewhere, maybe in a baby app, and that's what got me to do that. There are a lot of videos here on YouTube showing how to give a perineal massage. You can do it, but if you can't reach, your partner or someone that you are comfortable with can help you with this. A perineal massage during pregnancy helps create elasticity around the opening of the vagina. This is done with coconut oil maybe or a lubricant that you are comfortable with using and works well with your body so it doesn't cause yeast infections and things like that. Use two fingers and rub the bottom part of the vaginal opening or perineum. Your provider may also do this while you're pushing and again I personally think that this is something that a provider should gain consent from you to do and you should decide whether you're comfortable with it or not. 
So definitely discuss this with your provider to see if they do it and let them know how you feel about it. How much research is done on the perineal massage, unfortunately, it is a good thing to do if you want to prepare more and if you're comfortable with it. There's no shame in just trying something, unless it's hurtful or something like that. Again, definitely don't do this if you're uncomfortable with it. A warm or hot compress while pushing may help reduce tear and it may also help reduce the need for an episiotomy, which we learned that episiotomies really aren't that commonly necessary. All in all, the warm compress can help reduce pain, which is helpful because you might feel the ring of fire during this time. And the ring of fire is when your vaginal opening kind of starts to burn and your baby's head is literally crowning and your vagina is wrapped around your baby's head and your baby's trying to come out so this kind of creates a burning sensation in your vaginal opening. Water birth may also help reduce tears and especially episiotomies. According to evidence-based birth, water birth is linked to a decrease in the rate of third and fourth degree tears. Not only does the water relax your entire body, which is what I felt, it relaxes your perineum, which can help your vagina be more elastic. Just wanted to a little bit more from an evidence-based birth article which was updated in 2018. It is evidence on water birth and I actually want to do a whole video on water birth in the future. It just shares a little bit more on vaginal tear. According to evidence-based research, water birth can help you have a normal vaginal birth. And again, that includes lower rates of episiotomy, higher rates of intact perineum, especially in high episiotomy settings with possibility of lower rates of severe tearing. Don't birth on your back. I've seen this several times and in other articles, some research backs this. Studies do show that being upright is the more optimal position when giving birth because when you're laying on your back, it reduces the aid in gravity, helping bring your baby down and out. And the goal is to bring your baby down and out. Unless you're comfortable with laying on your back and unless your body tells you to lay on your back, try to be upright. Try to be in whatever position is most comfortable for you. I believe that birthing in a position that you feel comfortable in, that your body tells you to get in, can help aid in reducing third and fourth degree tear and of course risks of episiotomy. This article from Lamaze International discusses purple pushing and what exactly that is. Despite what the media likes to depict, pushing while lying flat on your back during labor may not be the most comfortable, helpful, or efficient way to birth a baby. According to the Lamaze Healthy Birth Practices, upright positions such as standing, kneeling, or squatting take advantage of gravity to help your baby move down into the pelvis. Squatting increases the size of the pelvis, providing more room for the baby to move down. Additionally, the outdated holding your breath and count to 10 and push method of pushing is not ideal, also known as purple pushing, because your face turns purple when you hold your breath. This style of pushing is often used in many hospital labor rooms, but it can deprive your body of oxygen, add undue stress to you and your baby, and increase your risk for perennial tears and further weaken your pelvic floor muscles after birth. A healthier way to push is to follow your body's instincts and cues to push, taking breaks when needed and bear down when you feel the urge. Here is a collection of research done by NCBI's website and it is pretty outdated but I wanted to share this as I felt certain parts of it go along with this topic. A recent survey of women who gave birth in the U.S. in 2005 reported that 57% gave birth lying on their backs and an additional 35 gave birth propped up in a semi-sitting position. Only 21% of women in the survey followed their own urge to push. The rest of the women reported that nurses or other providers coached them to push a certain way. On the same article, there was the six care practices that support normal birth. Care practice number five, spontane spontaneous pushing in upright or gravity neutral positions. Key point, upright and gravity neutral positions are safe during pushing and are often more comfortable than lying on your back. Following your own urge to push is less stressful for your baby than directed pushing. Pushing when and how your natural urge tells you to gives you the best chance of preventing tears and muscle weakness in your pelvis after birth. I thought this information was important to share just because it mentions that pushing when and how you feel like pushing can prevent tears and muscle weakness in your pelvic floor. And it also mentions lying on your back. Don't hold your breath 
and watch how you breathe when you're pushing. How you breathe during labor, I personally think could benefit a birthing person. I read a research article from NCBI's website and this is the materials and methods. This randomized clinical trial was performed on 166 pregnant women who had reached full-term pregnancy, had low-risk pregnancy, and were candidates for vaginal delivery in two of the following groups, using breathing techniques, which was the case group, and Valsalva maneuver control group. In the control group, pushing was done with holding the breath in the case group, the women were asked to take two deep abdominal breaths on the onset of pain, then take a deep breath and push four to five seconds and with the mouth open while controlling exhalation. From the crowning stage onward, the women were directed to control their pushing and do the blowing technique. It's concluded that breathing technique of blowing can be a good alternative to Valsalva maneuver in order to reduce perennial damage in laboring women. Your instincts can help you find what position is best for you, like I said, with not laying on your back. But if that's comfortable for you, totally do it. I just wouldn't suggest that to everyone. I wouldn't say that that's the most optimal position that you could be in. Once you hit transition, a comfortable position might be very helpful to you and you can kind of start thinking of what position might I feel best pushing or giving birth to my baby in. Believe in yourself and your body. I know that that sounds so corny and so cheesy, but for real, our bodies pretty much know what to do. Sometimes our bodies need help. Sometimes birth doesn't go to plan. That's okay. But most of the time our bodies know what to do and other things kind of get in the way. Make sure that you have a supportive birth team that supports you that are going to cheer you on rather than discourage you. And remember that it can be common for a first time parent to tear. Have birth preferences, but know that birth can change sometimes. Please remember that an episiotomy should always be done with consent unless there is is just some sort of emergency where it absolutely needs to be done. I honestly didn't even feel myself tear with my second child because everything happened so fast. I think I felt the ring of fire, which was her crowning in my vaginal opening, more than I actually felt the tear. I thought that it would be really important to share this article from Evidence Based Birth about pushing because what I experienced, I actually believe, was fetal ejection reflex and evidence-based birth briefly mentions that in this article. In some unmedicated births, the active pushing phase may be more accurately described as the fetal ejection reflex, where the mother waits for her baby to descend and then her body expels the baby with little or no conscious effort. Mothers sometimes describe this as, I wasn't pushing, my baby was just coming out. Did you do anything to prevent vaginal tearing? If so, let me know. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you'd like, and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to check out Bumps and Boobs on Instagram.